Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, to our uh, first session of the afternoon, which will focus on uh, emerging uh, issues in U.S. federal law for carbon dioxide removal. Um, as we've moved now from the imaginary stage of uh, carbon removal to uh, uh, starting to uh, uh, cite projects and certainly engage in R&D in earnest, uh, the role of uh, federal law in uh, facilitating and ensuring that uh, carbon removal is done responsibly uh, has become uh, extremely important. And this panel will focus on some of these uh, critical topics. Uh, and I will uh, turn it over now to the uh, moderator for uh, this uh, panel, uh, Professor Michael Gerard, who is the uh, founding director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at uh, Columbia Law School. Thank you very much for joining us, Mike. Well, thanks very much. And thanks very much for all your work in putting on this terrific uh, conference. So we have three excellent uh, speakers for this panel. Uh, each is going to talk for about 25 minutes, and then we'll invite uh, questions. If anybody has questions, please put them in the chat, and we'll uh, post them at the end. I'm going to introduce each speaker separately before he or she speaks. Um, and so our first speaker is my colleague, Romani Webb, who's going to be talking about developing federal legislation to advance responsible ocean CDR research. Uh, Romani is an associate research scholar at the uh, at Columbia Law School and a senior fellow uh, at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. Her research focus is primarily on climate change mitigation, exploring how legal tools can be used to drive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and support efforts to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. She's written extensively on legal issues relating to carbon uh, capture, removal, and storage, both onshore and offshore. In 2020, Romani was appointed to the National Academy's Committee on a Research Strategy for Ocean-Based Carbon Dioxide Removal and Sequestration. She also serves on several advisory boards and committees uh, overseeing scientific research and other projects related to offshore carbon capture and storage, including work being led by the American Geophysical Union, the Aspen Institute, and the GMR Health uh, Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research. She holds an LLM from the University of California at Berkeley and an LLB from the University of New South Wales. Uh, Romani, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Michael. Um, and thanks to Will and, and Jennifer and the other organizers for putting together this um, great conference and inviting me to participate. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully you all can see my slides. Um, if you can't, maybe someone can let me know. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today about the legal framework for um, ocean-based carbon dioxide removal and um, specifically about the need for legal reforms to facilitate safe and responsible ocean CDR research. Um, and at the outset, I just wanna note that my remarks today are informed by uh, work we have been doing at the Sabin Center for a couple of years now. Um, and my Sabin Center colleague, Corey Silverman Rolati um, has been a big contributor to the, that work. So I just want to acknowledge that and, and thank him. Um, so ocean carbon dioxide removal. Um, as many of you will know, there is growing interest in the possibility of using the oceans to um, remove and sequester carbon dioxide from the, from the atmosphere. Um, the ocean is already really a very large carbon sink it's estimated to have absorbed about 30% of anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions just through natural processes. Um, and scientists have proposed a variety of techniques to enhance those natural processes and thereby enable the ocean to absorb and store more carbon dioxide. Um, so this image on this slide, which I took from the 2022 National Academies report on ocean CDR, shows some of the commonly discussed techniques um, nutrient or ocean fertilization, which involves adding um, micronutrients like iron or macronutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus um, to the ocean. The goal there is to stimulate the growth of phytoplankton um, that uptake carbon dioxide as they grow. Um, and hopefully that carbon dioxide ends up sequestered um, in the deep ocean for extended periods of time. 
Um, artificial upwelling and downwelling has sort of a similar um, end goal, uh, but it works a little bit differently. Um, it involves installing um, large vertical pipes in the ocean to cycle water between the deep ocean um, and the surface. Um, so the goal is to sort of upwell or, or bring to the surface nutrient rich um, water from the deep ocean, um, bring that up to the surface again to stimulate phytoplankton growth, um, to, to uptake carbon dioxide, um, and also to, to downwell carbon dioxide rich water um, into the deep ocean. Um, seaweed cultivation is another technique that's been receiving a lot of attention recently. Um, seaweed like kelp um, similarly uptakes carbon dioxide as it grows, um, converts that carbon dioxide into organic carbon that ends up stored primarily in the biomass in the plants themselves. Um, so there's been proposals for sort of large scale um, cultivation of seaweed um, and then the collection of that seaweed and the sinking it um, into the deep ocean to sequester the carbon it contains. Um, ocean alkalinity enhancement is another commonly discussed technique, uh, basically involves um, adding alkalinity to the ocean to ocean waters. Um, that addition triggers chemical reactions that convert um, carbon dioxide in the water into other forms of dissolved inorganic carbon, um, thus enabling the water to absorb more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, there are also a, a whole suite of electrochemical approaches, which are shown um, in this image as being coastal, but could also in theory occur offshore. Um, basically approaches that involve using electricity to drive chemical reactions, um, either to remove carbon dioxide directly from uh, ocean waters or to um, add alkalinity to those ocean waters. Um, a key finding from the 2022 National Academies report was that um, further research is needed into these different techniques. Um, most of these techniques have not been um, tested in, at scale in the ocean. Um, and so there is a need for in-ocean controlled field trials to verify that they actually work in uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and durably storing it. Um, on sort of timescales that are useful for climate change mitigation purposes. Um, we also need to fully evaluate sort of the other impacts that they might have and any risks, um, for example, to marine ecosystems. Um, as many of you will know, um, we're already seeing large investments in research from governments around the world. Here in the United States, the Department of Energy has invested around um, $30 million in uh, research to develop new techniques for large scale um, seaweed cultivation as part of its Mariner project. Um, the department's also looking at other ocean based carbon removal techniques um, in the energy in the Energy Act of 2020 um, Congress directed the department to to look um, at a variety of techniques, including techniques for removing carbon dioxide from seawater and appropriated additional funding for um, research into those techniques. There's also a number of um, bills currently before Congress that would further increase uh, funding for research, um, including um, the CREST Act that some of you might have heard of, been receiving a lot of attention. In addition to this government funding for research, we've also seen a lot of um, private investment in ocean uh, CDR uh, here in the United States, a lot of new startups being established uh, to develop and really commercialize different ocean CDR techniques. Um, so it's really, um, in some ways, seeing the development of sort of a new industry around ocean CDR. There's been a lot of discussion of um, policies that could be used or that might be required to sort of support the development of that, that new industry. Um, but the legal framework in which it operates has received a lot less attention. Um, and that's a real issue because, you know, legal considerations could end up having um, a really significant impact on whether, when, where and how um, different ocean carbon dioxide removal projects happen. Um, so we at the Sabin Centre have been looking at how um, uh, ocean carbon dioxide removal fits within existing legal frameworks, both at the international level and domestically in the United States. Um, our domestic work has um, looked specifically at the application of US federal law to key ocean carbon removal techniques. Um, so we've published white papers looking at seaweed cultivation, artificial upwelling and downwelling, ocean fertilization and ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, 
One common finding across those white papers is that there is currently no sort of single um, comprehensive legal framework specific to ocean carbon dioxide removal. Um, but there is a large body of um, more general environmental law that could apply to ocean carbon removal projects. Um, those general laws were um, developed to regulate other activities. And so there um, is often uncertainty and complexity around their application to ocean carbon removal. Um, depending on where they occur and the precise activities they involve, some ocean carbon removal projects could be subject um, to sort of multiple um, overlapping permit and other legal requirements that could make um, you know, moving ahead with research and ultimately deployment difficult. Um, part of the complexity here stems from the fact that we are um, talking about activities in the ocean, which is of course a um, shared resource. Under international law, generally speaking, um, countries that border the ocean like the United States have jurisdiction over areas within um, 200 nautical miles of their shores. Um, here in the United States, that 200 nautical mile zone is shared, or jurisdiction over that 200 nautical mile zone is um, shared among the federal government, the coastal states, and in some areas, localities within the, those coastal states. Um, a sort of overarching legal framework is set out in a um, statute called, the, a federal statute called the Submerged Lands Act. And that act um, declares that the boundaries of each coastal state um, extend three nautical miles from the coast, except in the Gulf of Mexico, where the boundaries of Texas and Florida extend um, nine nautical miles from the coast. The Submerged Lands Act provides that um, coastal states have title to and ownership of um, lands beneath ocean waters within their boundaries and the right to um, manage, lease, develop, and use those lands and, natural, and the natural resources they contain. Um, so in effect, the states have primary jurisdiction over nearshore areas, typically within three nautical miles of the coast, um, and the federal government has um, jurisdiction over areas further offshore, generally three to 200 nautical miles from the coast. But this distinction between um, federal and state waters is not clear cut. And um, there is actually quite a large body of, of federal law that applies in state waters. And the result is a very um, complex legal framework. And I think that complexity is well illustrated um, by this table, which again, I took from the 2022 National Academies report. Um, it shows um, some of the key federal environmental laws that could um, apply to different ocean CDR techniques in different, um, in different locations. Um, the report notes that this is a non-exhaustive list, but even so, you can see that there are a, a large number of potentially applicable federal statutes. Um, broadly speaking, those, those um, federal laws can be divided into sort of five key categories. Um, so many ocean carbon removal projects will be subject to environmental review laws like NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, as many of you will know, NEPA requires preparation of an environmental impact statement for any um, major federal action that significantly affects the environment. Um, federal actions include those that are undertaken, authorized or funded by the federal government. And so even if an ocean CDR project were um, undertaken by a private party, if it required a federal permit or, or received federal funding, then NEPA could apply. Um, Many ocean CDR projects could also be subject to species protection laws like the Endangered Species Act. Um, among other things, that act requires federal agencies to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service before um, undertaking authorizing or funding uh, projects that um, could jeopardize the continued existence of listed endangered or threatened species. Um, ocean CDR projects could um, pose risks to, to um, various species and, and so might trigger that consultation requirement if they're um, federally permitted or, or federally funded. Um, and there are also um, similar consultation and other requirements in um, other species protection laws like the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Magnuson-Stevens um, Conservation and Management Act. Um, there's also uh, a body of sort of coastal and ocean management laws, like the Coastal Zone Management Act, that could apply um, to ocean CDR projects in some cases. 
Um, the Coastal Zone Management Act specifically will apply to projects um, that, again, are funded, authorized or carried out by the federal government um, where those projects could affect land or water use or natural resources in um, state waters or adjacent shorelands. So even if a project occurs um, in entirely in federal waters, if it has sort of implications for um, the use of state waters or resources in those state waters, then that can trigger application of the, the Coastal Zone Management Act and um, lead to requirements for um, consultation with states and, and other, other requirements. Um, there are also seabed use laws that could apply. So many um, ocean carbon dioxide removal activities will require the installation of structures um, in the ocean that might be attached to or otherwise use the seabed. Um, so things like um, platforms to house electrochemical ocean carbon removal systems, um, pipes for artificial upwelling and downwelling that are um, sort of attached to the seabed and use the seabed. Um, Nearshore, as I said before, um, in nearshore areas, the, the seabed underlying state waters is controlled by the states. Um, further offshore, outside state waters, um, the, the seabed underlying US federal waters is controlled by the federal government. Um, the Federal Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act creates a um, system under which the federal government through the Department of the Interior can um, issue leases over that submerged land um, to private parties, allowing them to use the land. Um, currently, the sort of circumstances in which leases um, can be issued are relatively limited. Um, they can be issued primarily for sort of energy and mineral development. Um, so things like offshore oil and gas drilling and offshore renewable energy development. Um, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill that um, Congress passed last year, the, um, the Department of the Interior was authorized to also issue leases um, for the subsea bed storage of carbon dioxide. Um, but the Department of the Interior still doesn't have specific authority to issue leases for other ocean carbon removal projects that don't involve subsea bed storage. Um, Finally, there are ocean dumping laws like the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act, which um, regulates uh, effectively the discharge of materials into ocean waters. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. But first, you know, as you can probably tell from this quick overview, there are a large number of federal laws that could apply um, to ocean carbon removal projects. And on top of all these federal laws, some projects might also be subject to state and even local law um, in some cases. Um, and so the result, as I said, is this really complicated legal framework, which um, may sometimes be quite difficult for ocean carbon dioxide removal project proponents to navigate um, and take significant time um, and involve significant cost. Um, there are also in some cases um, sort of gaps in the, in the legal framework. Um, so one example of this is the in the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act. Um, that act, as I said, regulates the dumping of materials into ocean waters. Um, the Act includes quite a broad definition of dumping um, as defining it as any disposition of material. Um, notably though, dumping does not include the construction of any fixed structure or artificial islands or the intentional placement of any device in ocean waters for a purpose other than disposal when such construction or placement is otherwise regulated by federal or state law. Um, so there would seem to be a good argument that the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act doesn't apply to, for example, um, the installation of pipes in connection with artificial upwelling and downwelling, um, because that's a placement of a device or a, a construction of a structure. Um, but it would apply to, um, for example, uh, ocean fertilization projects that involve the discharge of materials from vessels. Um, under the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act, a permit is required from um, the Environmental Protection Agency to um, dump materials within 12 nautical miles of the US coast um, and further offshore where dumping is performed um, using a vessel that is registered or was loaded in the United States. So um, that is fairly broad coverage, but um, there is no uh, you know, in the Act, there's no requirement to obtain a permit um, to dump further offshore beyond 12 nautical miles from the coast in US waters, 
if that dumping is performed using a foreign vessel that um, isn't registered and wasn't loaded in the United States. Um, so that's just one example, but um, shows, I think, how existing legal frameworks um, might not always be a perfect fit for ocean carbon dioxide removal, or at least some ocean carbon dioxide removal techniques. Um, in some cases, existing frameworks might not adequately address um, risks uh, that those techniques present to the environment and communities. Um, they may create opportunities for rogue actors to um, try to skirt the law or, or design projects in ways that avoid legal controls and oversight. And if that happens, it could affect um, public perceptions and, and lead to public opposition to ocean carbon dioxide removal. Um, and that could in turn hinder um, research that is needed to evaluate whether ocean carbon dioxide removal can be part of um, uh, our sort of uh, climate change mitigation solution or toolbox. Um, and so recognizing all of this, the 2022 National Academies report um, concluded that there is a need um, to develop a clear and consistent um, legal framework for ocean carbon removal research. Um, and that framework really needs to achieve sort of two goals. Um, first, it should facilitate um, needed ocean carbon dioxide removal research. And second, it should ensure that that research occurs in a scientifically sound, safe and responsible manner. Um, so in June, with the support of Ocean Visions, um, the Sabin Center launched a new project to um, develop model federal laws for ocean carbon dioxide removal research. Um, the aim of the project is to sort of draft model um, federal legislation that could be enacted by Congress to create a legal framework for ocean carbon dioxide removal research. Um, and so we aim to do um, in the legislation, we aim to um, sort of address the scope of federal authority to regulate ocean carbon dioxide removal research, um, uh, establish a um, regime for permitting research projects, establish requirements for uh, consultation and assessment of environmental risks, and um, safeguards to ensure that risks are, you know, effectively monitored and managed and that projects are otherwise conducted in a um, scientifically sound, safe and responsible way. As we think about crafting um, this new legal framework, there are lots of difficult questions that um, still need to be resolved. Um, so for example, our goal is to craft a legal framework to facilitate safe and responsible ocean carbon dioxide removal research, but what actually qualifies as research? Um, there's often not a clear distinction between uh, research activities, particularly in ocean research activities and deployment. You know, how do we determine what qualifies as research? Uh, should there be restrictions on who can conduct research or for what purpose? Um, at the international level, in the context of discussions around ocean fertilization, the parties to the London Convention and protocol have said that, um, you know, generally speaking, for a project to qualify as research, it shouldn't yield any um, sort of financial or economic gain. Um, is that appropriate or is that too narrow a view of research? Um, there are also questions about the scope of federal authority to regulate um, ocean carbon dioxide removal research. Should the federal government regulate all in ocean um, carbon removal research projects, including those that occur um, near to shore in state waters? Uh, what, if any, um, oversight or control should coastal states have over those sorts of activities? Um, what factors should be considered in the permitting of research projects? Um, you know, can the same um, considerations be used for research into, say, um, ocean fertilization and seaweed cultivation? Or are there different considerations that might arise in connection with different um, ocean carbon dioxide removal techniques? Um, we're also thinking through issues around um, environmental review, um, the application of, of statutes like NEPA, um, the consultation requirements in the ESA, um, and also other consultation, stakeholder consultation requirements for ocean carbon dioxide removal research. Um, and of course, safeguards that are needed to ensure that research is conducted in a safe and responsible way. Um, so currently, as part of our model laws project, we're um, soliciting sort of feedback on these and other key questions um, uh, 
that are arising. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the project, um, I'd encourage you to check out our um, climate law blog, which has a, a more detailed overview of the project. And if you're interested in engaging with us um, on these topics, um, please reach out to myself or my colleague, Corey silverman Rolati. Um, we're really uh, keen to engage with people on these issues. And that's it, thanks. Thanks very much, Roman. I appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is Tracy Hester, who's going to be talking about, his title is Direct Indirection, Exploring Le Legal Bases to Directly Challenge the Removal of Ambient Carbon Dioxide. Uh, Tracy is a lecturer at the University of Houston Law Center, where he teaches courses on environmental law, climate change, emerging technologies, and statutory interpretation. His research focuses on the innovative application of environmental laws to emerging technologies and risks, such as climate engineering, genetic modification, nanotechnologies, and wind and other renewable energy projects, and on novel compliance and liability issues. Tracy also writes on the application of environmental criminal laws to disasters and accidental releases. He was inducted into the American College of Environmental Lawyers in 2015, elected as a member of the American Law Institute in 2004, and named as the top environmental lawyer in Houston in 2011 by Best Lawyers of America. He's also on the Council of the American Bar Association's Section of Environment, Energy, and Resources, and currently chairs their uh, law professors committee. I'll only add that uh, a few years ago, Tracy and I co-edited a book called Climate Engineering and the Law, Regulation and Liability for Solar Radiation Management and Carbon Dioxide Removal. <laughs> and if you think that uh, carbon dioxide removal is controversial, just start thinking about solar radiation management. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tracy. Uh, thank you, Mike. As always, it's a pleasure to join you. It's, uh, as always, a daunting challenge to follow up Romani, who uh, has a very thoughtful and, and very uh, dense presentation. I, I wanted to give everyone here a little bit of a, a, a warning about a change in tone, which is uh, my talk is going to be more focused on identifying potential issues that may be developing and I, probably trying to spot ways to address them as they develop. So the uh, focus of my discussion is essentially a thought experiment. What sort of legal issues are we going to likely see develop if we see carbon dioxide removal and particular negative emissions technologies developed at full scale? Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to try and share my screen and uh, hopefully technology gods will cooperate. Hold on one second. Let's try this a different way, my apologies. There we go. So first, block number one of this discussion is just to emphasize a point that's already been made repeatedly during our discussions this morning, which is that we are on the verge of seeing an enormous scale up of activities related to negative emissions technologies and direct air capture. Uh, I've put up here just a brief notice of intent that many of us have probably seen in the audience, which is uh, DOE's uh, request for uh, proposals to uh, establish initial work for DAC hubs, uh, four different hubs located in different regions, each scaling up to close to a billion dollars in investment each. Uh, that is uh, only a piece of the bipartisan infrastructure law. It's also only a, a, in parallel to multiple other hub systems in place, including the hydrogen hubs. Uh, the bottom line is that we are likely to see an expansion of different types of projects related to negative emissions technologies. And that's going to change the tenor of the type of work that we've been seeing from them on the legal side. Uh, we can expect that these projects, which uh, have been previously located near perhaps emission sources or convenient infrastructure, uh, are now going to become perhaps more visible, more prominent, more uh, diverse in locations, as opposed to co-located in industrial areas, uh, which poses, as we know, different environmental justice concerns, but not the same sort of uh, possibility of legal challenge. Call me a legal pessimist, 
but I think that if we are expecting to scale up uh, uh, negative emissions technologies, including things like direct air capture, uh, up to a gigaton uh, per year in the United States, compared to the six gigatons that are emitted annually, as Dr. Wilcox pointed out, uh, the odds are high that some of these facilities in some locations are going to face legal challenges uh, for multiple reasons. And as a result, uh, I've been trying to work with some others to just identify what sort of bases we can expect from those challenges. Uh, for our discussion today, uh, my emphasis is going to be focusing very much on direct air capture, which I think presents the clearest test case for some of these legal issues that we're going to talk about. But obviously, they overlap as well with other types of negative emissions technologies. Uh, and also, I'm going to be focusing very much specifically on negative emissions technologies and CDR, but not on carbon capture storage or sequestration at point sources, which have a whole host of separate legal issues. So the thought experiment is this. Imagine a greenfield, which has a proposal to construct on-site a large-scale direct air capture facility that would draw on local renewable power sources that would then go into operation to remove a sizable amount of CO2 directly from the ambient atmosphere. Imagine as well that in the joining community, for reasons that we can go into that could be diverse and multiple, but decides that they are going to object to the construction and operation of this facility, and they approached legal help to try and identify strategies that would be effective to do so. One thing that I think is clear, and this is sort of block two of our discussion today, is that the default approach under current U.S. federal law is to regulate by surrogate, essentially focus on side effects that are caused by the operation, but not on the core act of removing the CO2 directly itself from the atmosphere. So as a result, this facility may come to a challenge because it generates a particular type of spent caustic waste that has to be disposed of. It may come to a challenge because it uses a particular kind of compression engine that results in incidental emissions of other air pollutants that require the need for a permit under the Clean Air Act. It may be located at an area where there are endangered species or critical habitat for those species, which would require some degree of assessment from the federal government for any permitting related to it, or alternatively, direct prohibitions on any actions that may result in a taking of those protected species. And it may involve some type of approval process that constitutes a major federal action, which require the preparation of a National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, Environmental Impact Statement. Uh, the thing is, you can have facilities that look very much alike, receiving completely different legal review based on vagaries of circumstance, location, the size, the grid of the power it's drawing on, the location of particular ecosystems nearby. As a result, the oversight, the governance of this process can have inconsistent, non-uniform approaches, uh, results. Uh, this regulation by aspect uh, is not one that is well suited to steering towards a particularly desired policy outcome. This aspect uh, feature is complicated by the way federal environmental laws are largely structured, which is that they do not consistently regulate through one integrated statutory framework, but instead rely on statutes that regulate separately different environmental media. So not only are you focusing on different aspects of facilities, you're also using the Clean Air Act for air emissions, the Clean Water Act for water discharges, the RICRA, uh, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act for hazardous waste, uh, all of which have different histories, terminologies, structures, and permitting processes that also need to be integrated. This also enhances the degree of inconsistency you might get for comparably located facilities. So uh, as a result, how things get regulated and how they get challenged in a legal framework are gonna depend very heavily on the facts of individual locations, processes, and potentially applicable regulations. Uh, so in bottom line, I think that from a direct air capture industry perspective, that is not surprising. Essentially, what I'm telling you is that these facilities are going to be regulated just like any other industrial facility in the United States. And that when you focus on how to regulate and permit them, the emphasis is typically not on what's happening inside the building, but instead on what's coming out 
of the operation or its impacts in the directly surrounding environment. There are some things that do reach inside the building, things that we need to think about that may be particularly relevant for direct air capture. For example, if some of the captured uh, CO2 is being converted into uh, carbon zero or net negative fuels, uh, you may trigger some Clean Air Act certification review requirements if they're being used in mobile sources. Uh, you may also see some elements of these capture processes being incorporated or included in other types of permitting programs, which gives them an indirect degree of boost or oversight. For example, if they are integrated into selections of technologies that are used to show attainment with Clean Air Act standards. But by and large, again, it's not something that is designed to give you some degree of consistent, credible review, and it creates opportunities for challenges based on the facilities. Uh, a few other comments I'll make uh, that sort of go to this at the current uh, default strategy. Uh, besides the sort of inconsistent results, the, a lot of times they tend to have a one-way effect. Uh, when you use this type of framework, this kind of statutory structure, you can end up in a situation where it's not good at, at encouraging activity, but it's very good at deterring activity. It's a bit of a one-way ratchet. So to a certain extent, if we desire to encourage negative emissions technologies and direct air capture, it is going to be uh, problematic that existing environmental laws uh, tend to operate more as a brake as opposed to an accelerator. Uh, the second is that this entire strategy I've outlined to you is in a state of flux, which increases uncertainty a bit. Essentially, the environmental laws in the United States, as many of you on this uh, audience know, have not in large part changed substantively since the 1970s and early 80s. Uh, the traditional response has been to take language and statutes and regulations that may be even decades old and extend and extrapolate them to apply to new circumstance. This sort of new wine and old bottles approach has come under direct questioning because of the uh, current emphasis on a newly formulated version of the major questions doctrine by the US Supreme Court. In West Virginia versus EPA, uh, in the, the immediately past term in June, the US Supreme Court ruled that the ability of regulatory agencies to rely on statutory language to achieve sweeping policy outcomes when that language does not clearly authorize that exercise of, of power uh, can lead the court to reject the agency's interpretation of that statutory language. The exact parameters of this new doctrine or the newly formulated doctrine, it's actually been around in different versions for a while, this newly invigorated doctrine have yet to be seen. Environmental seems to be the front line for it. We certainly expect to see this doctrine put into uh, immediately into the spotlight with the first oral argument of the Supreme Court next week in a case dealing with Clean Water Act jurisdiction. But the bottom line is that this is the system is sort of on the shelf and easy to apply, but it doesn't seem well suited to get at what's at the heart of negative emissions technologies, the things we care about. And that's because we have a, a paradox. A, a sort of a strange flip or reversal of the way the system typically works. And this is block three of the argument. Basically, most environmental laws use pollutants as a surrogate for environmental damage that requires regulatory protection. In other words, if uh, most environmental laws regulate the discharge of a pollutant into the environment as the critical trigger for exercise of regulatory power. The reasons they do so are obvious, ease, convenience, uh, ability to clearly delineate when an action is triggered, uh, but also because the discharge of pollutant by and large of history has been a good marker for the degree of damage you can expect that pollutant to have on the environment, which you wish to protect. Here, we're talking about the exact opposite. We're talking about the re removal of a pollutant from the environment. And when faced with that exact scenario, most federal environmental laws have nothing to say. You do not require a permit typically to remove a pollutant from the environment unless it has one of those collateral side effects that I discussed previously. So as a result, most of the principles involved with capture gas in the atmosphere are good old fashioned property law 
rooted all the way back to the common law doctrines of rule of capture going back centuries. Uh, there are multi-billion dollar industries constructed about the simple availability of taking gas from the atmosphere and by the very act of taking it, rendering it into personal private property that you own and have a compensable interest in. So that action doesn't require a permit, only the collateral environmental consequences of you doing it if you have side effects trigger regulation. So what if, going back to our original thought experiment, our adjoining community wanted to challenge a facility, not because it had a collateral side effect or perhaps because the planners thought very carefully, it doesn't have a regulatable, regulable side effect. Is there any legal theories that would govern the direct removal at vast scale, large amounts of CO2 or other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere? Uh, this is new territory. Uh, I would suggest though that there are a few candidates that might be developed as these legal challenges might proceed. Uh, the first and most immediate seems to be the doctrine of the public trust doctrine. This is a long-standing doctrine that goes back to Roman law, it is woven deeply into common law, British common law that became the, the uh, progenitor for US common law. It is uh, a common feature of all state law and uh, has been long upheld as a matter of federal law as well. This doctrine essentially says that there are certain elements of the state that under state sovereignty that are indispensable to the public good. And that as a result, the sovereign or the state or the, the government only holds those assets in trust for the benefit of the public that relies on them. That creates essentially a fiduciary duty, a special relationship on the part of the government to handle and discharge their management of those resources solely to the benefit of the public. And this doctrine was upheld back in 1892 in the Central Illinois Railroad versus Illinois case, but it really comes down to this. It imposes two things. One, a restriction on the ability of the state to alienate resources that it holds in trust for the public. It can be done, but it has a heightened standard of proof to show that it's in the public interest. Second, the public trust doctrine has been interpreted in other circumstances to require that the state take action in a positive way if some of those public resources are being jeopardized either by state action or by actions of others that the state can control. Uh, this public trust doctrine has typically been applied historically to water or beaches or other types of resources that fall into that sort of shared public domain. There has been, however, an attempt under the Our Children's Trust litigation to extend the public trust doctrine to the atmosphere. And while many of these decisions in all 50 states and in the federal level have not been successful, some have reached the proposition and upheld that the atmosphere is subject to the public trust doctrine, uh, including uh, even in my native state of Texas. As a result, there may be an issue raised at some point that whether or not the state is acting in its proper capacity in allowing the large scale removal of atmospheric gases from the atmosphere without some degree of direct regulation or oversight. Uh, that's one possibility. Another one is tort liability, which would be rooted in if this is done in such a way that it has unintended consequences. Uh, we could talk about some of those examples, but I, I will probably cut to the chase and simply say, for reasons I'll get into in a minute, the odds that removal of carbon dioxide in particular could have a localized impact seem remote, given the rapid mixing of CO2 and the uh, relative difficulty of creating a pace of removal that's so quick that it uh, has a localized impact. But having said that, uh, there are still nonetheless some prior arguments analysis made that disruption of certain types of shared services from the ecosystem could create a either negligence or even negative trespass claim. Uh, and some discussion about whether or not good Samaritan laws, which I'm glad to talk about Q&A, might offer a way to reframe those potential risks. Uh, these are also part of the negative nuisance and trespass items I've mentioned down below. Last, and this one probably is the one that is most likely to take place. Uh, even if an action is objectively to the benefit of the collective community, 
That doesn't mean that the community feels that it is uh, not entitled to a role in the decision process of its deployment and a participatory role as well in decisions on how they're regulated. Uh, this can take place both in the form of either public transparency and decision-making, say, for example, through applications of environmental impact statement requirements, or alternatively, and most importantly, through environmental justice framing, where if you are locating a large-scale direct air capture facility next to an environmental justice community, you may have a heightened obligation to make sure that that decision doesn't have collateral consequences that uh, need to be addressed in the context of historical injustice or uh, compensatory mitigation. So if this is the case, what should we be looking for in terms of how to proceed? Well, first, I just one sort of premise, which is I think the odds are pretty high that we're not going to have any question about whether the federal or state governments have the power to regulate this activity if they so choose to do so. Uh, it may be a question as to whether or not it's between the federal government or the state government. If you have locations, for example, that have interstate impacts, uh, there may be some difficulty about states across the border trying to regulate activities in another state. But by and large, this is the sort of activity that seems to have a clear constitutional basis for regulation by either level of government. The more interesting questions in terms of crafting a pathway ahead is who makes the call? If, for example, some of those state tort laws that I mentioned previously are deployed, is there some questions whether or not federal law might preempt them? In this regard, uh, this question is about to be squarely teed up in a different context with the climate liability tort lawsuits. They're currently working their way through 28 different actions in the state court systems where uh, there have been attempts for Supreme Court review uh, being sought on whether or not federal law preempts those state tort claims. Uh, we can get into some of the details of that if we wish to in the Q&A as well, but the bottom line is that the Supreme Court in ruling on state tort lawsuits may lay the groundwork for uh, similar types of tort challenges for negative emissions technologies. Uh, you can also find other ways to do it beyond just a simple regulatory fiat. Uh, as we all know now, uh, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, most, uh, many of the main drivers that are pushing ahead with activity are carrots rather than sticks. Well, carrots can also be an even more powerful way of regulation. Essentially, the power of Congress and regulatory agencies to dictate behavior through conditioning receipts of benefits on the performance of that behavior is actually sweeping, more so than perhaps arguably jurisdiction of the Commerce Clause or other parts of the federal constitution. So uh, as a result, you know, triggering that financial uh, benefit to performance of certain conditions that assure safety to local communities is another way for federal and state governments to participate in regulation without necessarily having to find a different hook under existing statutes. Last, a couple of other thoughts. Uh, this is not new in terms of finding ways to regulate a novel technology that is being deployed at larger scales. One possibility is rather than come up with a new law or new framing, you could figure out essentially a roadmap to stitch together the existing statutes and regulations in a way that's coherent and makes sense. In that regard, for example, with genetically modified organisms, we have essentially a coordinated framework that governs the, uh, the approval and deployment of genetically modified organisms for into the environment or for commerce. Uh, it essentially maps out which statutes apply to which organisms and which contexts. A similar type of roadmap might play a role here in assuring that the, the both federal and state governments are playing a role in the assurance that these technologies are not causing unanticipated effects or that their anticipated operations having uh, conditions that we want to make sure are acceptable to all parties. Uh, in that way, it essentially uh, gives an opportunity to to offer a surrogate form of regulation that in an ironic way provides some degree of protection to the operator of the direct air capture facility. And then last, again, I don't mean to make it last, it's just that it's so important it should not ever be forgotten. Environmental justice concepts will be interwoven into all these issues and must be paramount in planning for location of these facilities and how to authorize their oversight. Uh, let me finish then with uh, a point I think is 
it's very much worth making. Uh, I want to stress that it is paramount that we have some form of progress on negative emissions technologies and some way of attaining the trajectory we need to get to 1.5 degrees C or two degrees. I do not wish to complicate that trajectory by raising questions that may not actually be at the end of the day germane. Right? We do not need to distract ourselves from the task at hand, the eye and the prize, which is we need to figure out ways to get CO2, ambient CO2 levels and other greenhouse gases down in an incredibly expeditious way to prevent climate, uh, catastrophic climate damage. Uh, my spirit in offering these forecasts as potential challenges is to identify where they might ultimately become roadblocks so that we can think about them prospectively and have a rational, coherent way to deal with them should they arise. At the same time as well, you know, I would you know, just emphasize that you know, if we aren't careful, if we impose too many requirements on these technologies, you know, we have, of course, create a risk-risk uh, issue where the risk we're avoiding through regulation is actually smaller than the risk of untrammeled climate change. And I don't want to create a governance lock by having too many requirements. But the bottom line is that we do need to think about these issues, I think, in a way that rather than let them get served up to us in anticipated legal action seriatim, that we have a big picture in mind. That big picture should also, just to be honest about it, needs to be careful about collateral consequences to other industries that might get unintentionally swept up in some of these legal discussions or negative emissions technologies that might have knock-on unexpected effects for the existing industrial infrastructure that uh, relies on rule of capture for uh, removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So with that, I look forward to uh, hearing the rest of our presentations and Q&A in just a few minutes. Thank you. Tracy, thank you very much. Our third and final speaker for this panel is my colleague, Carolina Arlotta. She is Associate Research Scholar at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, where she researches international and U.S. laws governing the cross-border transport of carbon dioxide for sequestration and how such transportation fits into broader climate and environmental protection regimes, including the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Carolina is the co-editor of the book Carbon Capture and Storage in International Policy and Law, Perspectives on Sustainable Development, Climate Change, and Energy Transition, published by Elsevier in 2021. She's also a contributor to the Oxford Research Encyclopedia uh, with an article on international arbitration. She frequently publishes in law reviews and peer-reviewed journals. Uh, Carolina holds an LLM and uh, um, and a, a JSD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign College of Law, and is a licensed attorney in Brazil and in, in the U.S., in New York. Before uh, moving to the U.S., she was an attorney for Petrobras, and uh, her topic is when international advances local, assessing the Glasgow Climate Pact's consequences for U.S. domestic policies on carbon dioxide removal. Carolina, over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Gerard, for such a thoughtful introduction. I also would like to start thanking my fellow panelists for such outstanding uh, contributions. And of course, uh, to Professor Will Burns for putting together this excellent conference. Um, I hope my share screaming button will work. Um, which apparently doesn't look like it's working. Um, so I'll keep you in suspense, I guess. Um, advanced shared options. One would think that after two years teaching uh, online, I, I should be able to do that. But for some reason, uh, Try it now, Carolina. I, I think it's okay. Uh, it, it looks like you should be able to share. Yes, but I, so it's not, 
it, it should be the the uh, the share screen option that you see there and uh i see it says that multiple participants can share simultaneously so you should be able to have access I honestly don't know what's going on. I just changed my computer, so I'm sure that may be my fault. So I was I wondering if truth, Jennifer think, has my... Um, let's see, I have your um, slides, Carolina. Let me see. Multiple great, panels. that's what I was going to ask. Uh, it could, if you could do that, Mike, that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, do you... Hang on. Yes, second. I see that. Thank you. You, you I, see it now? Okay, let me put it in slideshow. Thank you, Mike. Um, Does that work? It it's working. I just wanted to because I add one single slide, but there's no problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mike, for that. Um, so my topic today, despite the technological issues, is when international advances local assessing the Glasgow Climate Pact's consequences for U.S. domestic policies on carbon dioxide removal. So despite this huge research question, I really want to start giving you an overview about the roads that led to Glasgow. So I'll talk a bit about International Treaties Paris Agreement and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Then I'll speak a bit about Glasgow Climate Pact, obviously. Uh, and then what does it mean when, when interpreted to or what we can foresee in terms of its consequences for US domestic policy. Now, before moving forward, I would like to call your attention for the fact that this is quite interesting um, if we think about in terms of international energy law and how countries have to reconcile economic growth access to energy resources and the fulfillment of international obligations. So often what it's called the energy trilemma here. So um, it, within this background, I give, I already presented like the three main parts of this talk uh, and we move forward with, of course, the background uh, when it comes to basically, and that's the next slide. Um, when it comes to where we are and what is the problem. And of course, global warming. So we have this increased in temperature that it's caused by the human influence. So the science is clear that nobody disputes that. Um, and of course, uh, when we think about carbon dioxide removal, and that's the next slide setting the stage, um, would be basically, uh, if we think about, uh, assuming you can go to the next slide. Um, it would be basically uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we I particularly think this setting, the stage is interesting because we can see within uh, 70 years how we are above uh, from data from 2020 uh, to 14, 414 um, parts per million when it comes to carbon dioxide. So this is data and my background is within law and economics, so that should be um, something of interest for us when we look actually at the numbers. So moving forward, uh, when we think about carbon dioxide removal and one of the perhaps challenges in reconciling domestic law with international law speaks to their own definition. So, and as Romani, um, excellent presentation uh, pointed out, uh, ways of carbon dioxide removal specifically, uh, but there is this distinction between carbon dioxide removal from a U.S. domestic energy definition to uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, basically the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, posting about anthropogenic removals, so a more holistic approach that um, then different than uh, what we have within the US. So that's the next slide. Um, thinking in specifically discussing direct air capture, coupled to durable storage, soil carbon sequestration, biomass carbon removal and storage, enhanced mineralization, ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, and afforestation, reforestation. So from this um, thorough definition, what we can see is that to the energy department in, within the US uh, encompasses technological approaches and natural approaches, uh, but carbon dioxide removal uh, does not refer to point source carbon capture for the fossil fuel or industrial sector 
And as mentioned earlier, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has a more holistic view when, with regard to the anthropogenic, anthropogenic removals. Moving forward to the next slide, we have the Paris Agreement. And, and you can see from the picture there, basically the three key elements, of course, we need to hold the temperature uh, less than two degrees to hopefully 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, we also need countries to review their national determined contributions every five years and leading to Glasgow, that was particularly important because that was the first um, period of five years that was uh, basically completed. And of course, climate financing towards developing nations. And as you know, I am, as you may know, I am Brazilian. So that's also a topic that speaks dear to my uh, Part. So when you think about the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement itself, we see carbon dioxide removal basically as among the mitigation actions uh, that our countries have to engage or consider to engage. And it's particularly helpful to think in terms of the national determined contributions because they need uh, to be coupled with other mitigation strategies. So specifically when it comes to the legal framework of the Paris Agreement, and what is so unique about it, we have top down this obligation to, for all countries, regardless if developing world or developed nations, to actually reduce that uh, carbon dioxide. And technically speaking, uh, both agreements speak, uh, refer to greenhouse gas emissions um, and also bottom up approaches that are. Uh, manifested within the national determined contributions. Interesting here, it's that's not the countries are not required to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by one percent, two percent of specific targets. So each country voluntarily pledges to such a reduction. It's true that under the framework of the Paris Agreement specifically, those nationally determined contributions they have to be more ambitious every five years. Uh, cycle. Um, I want to call your attention, and that's the next slide, uh, to the extent that both uh, Paris Agreement and the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change talk about uh, a particularly paying tribute to um, the principle of common but shared uh, responsibilities, which take into account uh, the country's capacities and also the historical contribution. And when I'm what I think it's particularly relevant within this slide is first, when we think about the US, how the US actually has been reducing uh, its own share of carbon dioxide emissions, which is a major uh, achievement on itself. Fair enough, according to most, most authors, not reducing enough considering its own emissions per capita, which would, it will be in the next slide. But we can see how countries, in particular India, are in the different uh, perspective, different path, meaning increasing actually in, the, uh, in, tw in 20 years actually double their own carbon dioxide uh, emissions. So um, moving forward, and this is the emissions per capita dated 2019, so we, um, before the pandemic, um, and we still have the US the leading uh, historical polluter and leading polluter per capita. Next slide, I wanna talk about a bit of uh, the carbon dioxide removal before actually um, moving to, um, the Glasgow Climate Pact. So what we can agree is the necessity of carbon dioxide removal. And that's something that it's not, an, it, from the current environmental perspective specifically, it's not an easy agreement. There was a lot of discussion. And it was so important that um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change six assessment report released last year before uh, Glasgow was very clear that Carbon, carbon dioxide removal needed to be um, included so countries could actually meet their national determined contributions that needs to be also more ambition. So all the five emissions pathways that limited globally average warming uh, in other scenarios, uh, they assume the use of carbon dioxide removal approaches in combination, of course, with emission reductions. Here we need to pause for a second and think, well, why it was so, uh, important to have the IPCC actually emphasizing that because a lot of the resi resistance was when it comes to um, carbon dioxide removal techniques was from an environmental justice perspective, like who actually will be uh, 
what parties would be significantly impacted or adversely impacted by such removal. Uh, it, uh, if you think about forestation, we're thinking about uh, issues relating to food security or how long such uh, removal, thinking natural based, again, reforestation uh, would be an example, uh, how long actually that carbon dioxide will be removed. So uh, for how long can we guarantee? When you think about more about the technical, technical uh, carbon dioxide removals based techniques, what we think uh, might be very straightforward to, in a country to other countries might not be. Um, so there are intellectual property issues uh, that will impact cooperation, for instance. Uh, there are also resistance when it comes, a major hurdle when it comes to carbon dioxide removals are the cost. So they're very expensive in general. And what countries actually can engage in that and pay for that and have such uh, such an interest um, and how and it takes longer to be implemented so again uh, something to consider and so this resistance itself uh, and again the importance of the sixth assessment report being that well it brings it changes the debate and for a scientific approach saying well it's needed either we incorporate that those carbon dioxide removals or we won't achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, so here we see the, um, obviously the IPCC taking a middle ground approach. So carbon dioxide removals are not a panacea that will solve all the problems because they were still stressing, emphasizing emission reductions, but it's not, so, it's not either a chimera like, well, it's only a, a bag of problems and challenges that hurt those starting with uh, problems related to environmental justice and of course, cost and time of implementation. Moving forward, we have a very colorful slide uh, of roads leading to Glasgow. And there is the red slide is look a bit of a history. I'll brief, I mentioned that already when I mentioned when I discussed Paris and uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. But I really want to call attention for the green um, arrow up there, uh, the roads to Glasgow, basically what needs to be achieved. So of course, uh, the goals of the Paris Agreement, which is specifically uh, Article 6 uh, of the Paris Agreement when it comes to market and non-market approaches that needed to be implemented. Also important protection of forests, um, and of course, end of coal, which I will discuss in a minute in the next slide when I, we discuss uh, and that's moving forward to the Glasgow Climate Pact um, that pays tribute to the IPCC scientific assessment, uh, stressing, emphasizing the necessity of carbon dioxide removal, and of course, implemented Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and I want to pause for a second here. Uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement has basically um, three prongs. So Article 6, Paragraph 2nd, with uh, in Article 6, paragraph four, both with market approaches uh, that ultimately will engage, will, should uh, foster cooperation between countries, among countries, when it comes to who feel better, stringent. Uh, yeah, 20% conversion. Contributions, I'm sorry. So moving forward, Article 6, Paragraph two allows countries to trade emission reductions and removals with one another through bilateral or multilateral invest, uh, multilateral agreements. Uh, and the straight credits actually, they're called uh, international transfer mitigation outcomes. And they are measured in terms of dioxide equivalent or other measured. When it comes to Article 6, Paragraph 4 of the Paris Agreement, this is uh, what we call the regulated market. And specifically, it, it's implemented under the supervisory body uh, as part of, and supervised by the Conference of the Parties. And it builds on the progress and challenges of the clean development mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which will be, uh, which it, as a transition mode will be effective until uh, 2023, and in some cases, even 2025 that countries can pledge. And what is of particular interest for our purposes here is that those credits can be bought by countries, by companies, and even individuals. So it was a major, major achievement that actually um, Article 6 market mechanisms were implemented. Uh, and specifically here, 
I want to talk, make a distinction that Article 6, Paragraph 2 um, is already, uh, as far as the framework itself, uh, fully open. Uh, operation, operational, and we have Japan and Switzerland already considering the straits. Of course, it takes time for countries to agree on bilateral treatments or multilateral treaties uh, to allow such trade, but it's supposed to be much faster than Article 6, Paragraph 4, uh, when it comes to the global market itself, uh, because issues of accreditation and supervision are still uh, needing further details. And actually, the Conference of the Parties is expecting it to be effective uh, around uh, 2030, like fully implemented and uh, kicking, I would say. Uh, when it comes to climate financing, major achievements of the Glasgow Climate Pact was actually to make countries uh, engage uh, significantly in climate financing, uh, developed world uh, sent uh, 100 billion towards uh, this funding, climate funding. Moving to the next slide, uh, we have a few limitations, so it's not obviously all uh, perfect. So uh, within the developing nations uh, pledges, uh, the original um, uh, writing of uh, the Glasgow Climate Pact would uh, predict a complete phase out of unabated coal, so coal without carbon capture and storage, uh, but then the pledge it end up with the language of um, phasing down, and that's actually the picture when the COP's president, COP26 president is showing to the delegates. Um, major point, we have all those countries pledging net zero. Nonetheless, we don't know actually what net, net zero means, so further clarification on that. And same with climate financing, when it comes to financing of, uh, developing nations, for instance, we know the projects relating to clean water and uh, environmental education uh, would count as for uh, those loans. Nonetheless, they will not, they're not tied to carbon dioxide or greenhouses, uh, gas mitigation specifically. Moving along to the next slide, we have Glasgow energy and policy choices. But in fact, and I think it's really interesting to look uh, first, the most used, um, Coal in the US is the second one in your slide. So coal bituminous with an average, uh, it's an average type of coal in terms of pollution or emission of carbon dioxide per unity. And of course, if it's when you think about natural gas, it's significantly, it's almost half of that in terms of uh, pounds per carbon dioxide that it's emitted. Nonetheless, it is still a lot. So 50 of a lot is still a lot. That's the math, simple math being uh, taken here. And, and within this context, uh, we have the necessity once again of carbon dioxide removal techniques and policies. So moving along uh, to the next slide, um, specifically what are the Glasgow Climate Pact consequences that we can say actually occur within the US or we can expect to occur. And of course, I mentioned earlier the law and economics, there's no causation, I didn't run any regression, so I cannot prove that. But thinking from a big picture kind of bird's view approach, uh, when you think about domestic influence, um, so of course, the necessity of carbon dioxide removal uh, as within the framework determined by uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So that should set the terms of the debate. So it's no longer, even though we have resistance uh, and all voices should be heard and considered when we think about from a policy perspective, uh, the necessity of carbon dioxide removal uh, is um, paramount. If the country is serious, uh, towards its achievement of its national determined contribution and ultimately Paris Agreement's goals. goals. We expect to boost on domestic investment, of course, foreign investment as well, to the extent that Article 6 um, provides all sort of corporations I specifically mentioned about um, paragraph second and fourth when it comes to the market um, approaches. Uh, I neglect uh, Article 6. Non-market approaches, basically this whole corporation that could be all, all everywhere between uh, social inclusivity to financial policies and measures, circular economy, blue carbon, just transition of workforce. Uh, so again, this cooperation that makes um, an important impact. And all of that plays in the background when we think about the 
the reduction ultimately of asymmetry of information. So this resistance that is portrayed in the literature when it comes to general techniques of carbon dioxide removals, it is important and it needs to be heard, but the more information we have in the international debate uh, and international forces, and of course, the intergovernmental panel uh, report, six assessment report, brings that additional information, basically from international artists saying, well, it's what we need now and it's urgent and it's uh, paramount. Moving on to the next slide, also discussing the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, I mentioned earlier, I set the debates for new policies in terms of more inclusive in policies, into uh, considering specifically investment or carbon dioxide removal uh, and trying to mitigate uh, potential uh, concerns from an environmental justice perspective, uh, including those voices within the discussion um, and also uh, spread having the investment itself, as we know uh, from the ARA recently. Um, and so that's a major point in reducing traditional position. It's expected to increase a financing for research uh, and streamlining international pro intellectual property issues uh, to the specifically here when countries are cooperating uh, and we have private actors directly involved. So next slide uh, within the glass of the climate pact. And again, it's a bit chicken and egg here when you think about domestic inf influence of so this progressive momentum that is, uh, of course, uh, based on federal leadership and it's so important because it kind of like levels uh, the battlefield for all 50 states in terms of like the importance of such activity. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the Inflation Reduction Act um, that was so important in terms of uh, extending comments of construction of the projects to 23, uh, 2033. Uh, also the famous 40K provision that changes the price of, basically for incentives. And this is particularly relevant because something that is very clear is that uh, investment in such uh, carbon dioxide removal technologies, not only it's expensive, but uh, it was not that attractive. So we've seen uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, so change an increase, for instance, uh, when you think about payment from 50 to 85 for CCS uh, and 50 to 180 when it comes to direct air capture. So significant numbers and economic incentives for uh, actors to actually engage in such activity. And we need a uh, federal government, if you think of a law and economics perspective, to actually act on that, uh, foster that activity. Otherwise, it wouldn't be um, feasible at this point in time with the technology that we have and the costs uh, on that barriers. Um, of course, climate justice and equity are a major concern and has been um, specific concern on the Article 6, as well to the extent that the clean um, development mechanism of Kyoto was perceived as being uh, delayed by uh, some of environmental justice considerations, sustainable development specifically. So there was some level of compromise when you think about Article 6 uh, of the Paris Agreement and its implementation. So again, a, a bit of a controversy here. Um, not airtight when it comes to double counting, but that's the critique and it was what parties could agree on. Uh, it's expected to have an uh, important influence when it comes to the energy transition and creation of jobs within clean energy. Energy transition here, of course, moving from fossil fuels to renewables and so forth, clean sources. Um, so answering my question, when are international advances local? That's the next slide. I'm sorry, Professor Gerard, I'm so embarrassed, mortified actually, but moving along. Um, so we can conclude that Glasgow reduced transaction costs for all involved parties. It welcomed the private sector, individuals that are willing, really willing to be engaged in such environmental protection um, within uh, mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions, specifically here for our purposes, carbon dioxide removal. Reinforce new paradigm for debate. So, in a sense, uh, carbon dioxide removal became a must. So, it's no longer a country should have it, but all countries should, uh, of course, depending on their capacity and capabilities and um, 
in, including financial resources. Um, it will foster trade because not only countries, but also um, private actors and individuals are ultimately involved, importance of a carbon market and international cooperation towards achieving such goal. Moving to the last night, when international advances local, uh, it emphasizes the importance of that if the resistance when it comes to uh, carbon dioxide removal techniques was based on environmental justice considerations, uh, there also ought to be environmental justice considerations that so many parties will suffer adverse impacts of uh, climate change, um, specifically minorities. Uh, women, children, uh, and so forth, uh, that it's either one approach or the other, they would suffer uh, is, uh, from such uh, greenhouse gases saturation in the atmosphere. So again, uh, a major point to be taken into account. The US is setting this example, is setting a clear message uh, by uh, incorporating, by investing in carbon dioxide removal. So leading by example, and recently on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, uh, it's an agreement that it has been international agreement that has been negotiated within the U.S. with the U.S. and other uh, Asian and Australia, and it specifically welcomes carbon dioxide removal. So last slide, my with questions and comments, and you've been a. a calm and very generous audience. And again, uh, apologies uh, for the slide and thank you for the thoughtful notes on the chat. And thank you, Professor Michael Gerard. Um, again, uh, no problem. So, of new uh, computer. Tracy and Romany, if you wanna put uh, your cameras back on and we'll take a, a look at, uh, at questions. And I see um, a question for Tracy here, which I'll, I'll read out. When thinking about potential legal challenges to large-scale negative emissions technologies, does the analysis look different when we're talking about carbon removal versus something like methane removal? It seems like it uh, might, given that most methane removal techniques involving converting methane into CO2, that has climate benefits because methane is more uh, more potent greenhouse gas than CO2, but CO2 is recognized as an air pollutant, such as under the Clean Air Act. So might there be more opportunities to challenge methane removal? What a fascinating question. And I think the short answer is it depends. Uh, methane does have some capacity for regulation of the Clean Air Act, but it has been subject to legislative pushback. So it's a little bit, uh, I think, less crystal clear as to when and how you can regulate methane. I think where it really is interesting, though it depends, is that a lot of the methane reduction proposals that I've seen have actually focused on uh, potential concerns. Again, I'm talking about ambient methane, not point source methane at, say, for example, uh, animal uh, for farming organ operations, uh, have been uh, typically in Arctic areas, uh, concerned about the destabilization of tundra or the permafrost for causing a significant releases of methane, or peat locations where you have significant releases of methane. Uh, those are areas where you actually have enhanced or special environmental rules that apply. So uh, to a certain extent, again, this may go back to my <laughs> default model where you, uh, you regulate uh, uh, coincidental features of the project rather than the actual act of the gas itself. Uh, the fact that they may be located in those special areas may mean that you've got other ways to, to uh, impose operation restrictions on how those operate. Uh, let me ask um, Romani a question. You talked about the uh, potential application of NEPA, and I'm interested in how that might play out. Do you think that uh, NEPA would primarily be uh, involved at the project-specific basis if there were federal action for a specific carbon dioxide removal action? Do you see it playing out as a programmatic basis, maybe over a whole program of research or deployment? some combination of the two? And, and do you have thoughts on what would be the idea? Yeah, thanks. Um, I do think some combination of the two is probably the ideal method. Um, you know, it would seem that um, a programmatic approach would um, help to streamline the, the environmental review process, um, because if you're thinking about something like seaweed cultivation, you know, all seaweed cultivation projects might raise similar issues that could be dealt with in a 
in a programmatic review and then to the extent that individual projects um, raise additional issues because of their precise location, then you could sort of deal with that in a tiered um, project specific review. Um, so there would seem to be some streamlining um, benefits to taking that approach. Um, it would be interesting, I think, to think about whether you could go one step further and do a programmatic assessment for say all forms of carbon removal um, and whether there is enough commonality um, across the different techniques to enable that. Um, it might be that that there are um, sort of some commonalities with sub sub categories of techniques. You know, um, the ultimate aim of something like ocean fertilization and artificial upwelling is similar in that you're intending to to um, influence phytoplankton growth. And so maybe you can look at those two together. Um, it'd be sort of interesting to think about um, the extent of commonality and differences in terms of the environmental impacts across those different techniques. I, I can't resist adding that that sounds like an excellent Saban Center white paper. Uh, I also would be curious whether the Mansion proposed bill might have something to say about some of these issues too. Well, certainly not explicitly, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it might have some effect on the, the pace of permitting. Let, let me just add on the programmatic issue. One thing that one could imagine would be programmatic for certain technology, and then if it is applied in a particular instance uh, a determination whether the particular instance is different enough from what was assessed in the programmatic review or raises new issues to require some kind of supplemental documentation which might not be a full supplemental EIS but it might be some additional uh, NEPA documentation but having to go through the full analysis every time for every project uh, doesn't seem to be a sensible way to uh, uh, to approach it. Um, some of the questions in the Q&A um, look like they're more for scientists than we lawyers, but let me just uh, raise uh, uh, one of them to see if anybody wants to address it. Another issue is the continued buildup of CO2 in the air is leading to ocean acidification, which is pushing the oceans towards CO2 liberation instead of further CO2 capture. Does anyone want to address that? But just say that, um, you know, there is a major problem, as as many people will know, with ocean acidification, and that it could, um, you know, this this idea that it could sort of turn the ocean from a sink into a, a release of um, a releaser of um, carbon dioxide is a huge concern. Um, some of the techniques that have been proposed for ocean carbon dioxide removal um, could actually have the co-benefit of addressing ocean um, acidification. Um, and so thinking through those opportunities, I think is really important. Um, but uh, the question and some of the other questions in the Q&A, the more technical questions um, that I am not qualified to answer, um, do I think highlight the need for additional research in this space? Um, you know, there are lots of unanswered questions here. Um, we don't want to sort of um, pursue these approaches if they're not actually gonna be effective in um, removing carbon dioxide or if they're gonna present other environmental risks. Um, and so in my uh, view that, you know, the, the role of the, the legal framework, as I said, should be to sort of create a framework that facilitates that, that research, but ensures that it happens safely and, and responsibly. So thank you. Uh, one question here, which is more legal. What are your thoughts on regulating carbon credits? What are the legal considerations behind ensuring that one kilogram per ton of carbon that is stored in the ground is permanently stored there and not leaked? That's an important question. Who would like to start with that? I know if I get started, it may be here for an hour. Um, but actually, Caroline, I, I did know that seems like it might be an Article 6 issue as well. I think didn't they specifically talk about the integrity of the credits that might result from ITMOS? Yes, and that has been a significant concern, uh, and specifically uh, NGOs were very vocal about it, environmental community. Uh, and it's not only when it comes to carbon capture and storage or whatever capture uh, mechanism we are talking, but even within the framework of reforestation, how long we can actually guarantee that the reforestation or forestation was actually uh, the forest will be there for 100 years, 150 years. Um, so it's uh, it needs to be taken into account. There are also issues when it comes to liability, right, that are specifically um, 
how if it's not then what countries uh, would be liable if anything else uh, and if it's within the framework of the private parties then how and one thing that i want to point out that's why uh, we specifically on the article 6 uh, paragraph 4 when you think about this new united nations framework convention on climate change it is, has been called mechanism right um, it's basically uh, this notion that uh, there are still details that need to be operational, but they need to be, countries need, uh, the countries where they're actually trying to pledge uh, for that, they need to have their approval in advance of their project. So that's one way to not only secure that the carbon will be in storage, but also uh, that will not be a double counting, which was a major uh, issue, a major challenge, I should say, when it comes to the clean development mechanism. So we're trying to, the international legal order is trying to learn from its past mistakes. But it's an ongoing process, not perfect, not airtight, and those issues are the legacy issue is also uh, something that has been very much uh, into discussion and into consideration. I hope I have answered. Tracy, please go ahead and Romani. Oh, no, I, I just had a, a dour post note from a legal perspective, and I'll, I'll pass the mic to Romani, which is uh, however you think about the integrity of carbon credits. One thing that's become increasingly clear is that they're being subject to legal scrutiny that may create some jeopardy for persons who do not take it seriously. Uh, if you look at, for example, some of the greenwashing lawsuits that are being filed in other environmental claims, it seems a pretty easy reach to include uh, in carbon credits that do not have uh, un unquestioned integrity. Uh, the possibility as well, I might point out, is if you take a look at the SEC proposed rule for climate disclosures, uh, companies that rely on their representation of scope one, two, and three emissions and auditing that use uh, questionable credits are going to find themselves in potentially some hot water down the road. So we're about out of time, but Romani, any final thoughts? Um, I would just say I think some of the um, you know issues around monitoring of ocean CDS approaches specifically create real challenges in the carbon credit um, space, and maybe these will be discussed in the next panel, but you know, it's it's not like a direct air capture facility where you have a stream of carbon dioxide that you're say injecting into the ground and you can sort of in some ways directly measure that. Um, a lot of the, the ocean CDR techniques rely on sort of modeling to estimate the amount of carbon you're sequestering and how long you're sequestering it for, which I think adds a whole nother layer of complexity um, in thinking about those approaches in a carbon credit regime. So we are regrettably out of time, even though there's much more to discuss. I want to thank Romani and Tracy and Carolina for excellent presentations. And I will now turn it back to Will.